So we today tried to kind of put a talk together that is going to speak to a little bit of all of these audiences. So let's see what's going on. So uh, we're here today to talk about some of the challenges and best practices that we've seen on our platform uh, with teams of data scientists when uh, they're trying to put models uh, that they develop into productions uh, over their life cycle. So, Again, just a little bit of intro um, between Moon and myself. So uh, I'm Louis Huard. I'm the senior product manager at Zeppel. Um, and I'm here uh, to kind of talk uh, about Zeppel, the platform, and also to kind of share my experiences that I've had as in my time as an analyst, as well uh, as my time as a product manager. And uh, Moon? Uh, hello, yeah, thanks for coming to this side of the house as the analyst, as the consultant, with working with business requirements, and so we hope our talk kind of meets in the middle. So a little bit about the Zeppel story. Uh, we, we kind of already touched on it, uh, but Moon uh, created the open source Apache Zeppelin in uh, 2012. We founded, uh, Apache, we founded Zeppel in 2016 to kind of serve the enterprise users, uh, to give them the features that they needed to help teams of data scientists uh, work together. And so ultimately we launched our platform as a SaaS product in, in 2018. And uh, we've, we've gotten great adoption at different companies such as Uber, Samsung, uh, and we're working uh, on, as well with partners such as Snowflake, Apple, uh, et cetera. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, and we, uh, I'd like to start from data science lifecycle. Uh, I think it, uh, most of the data science uh, projects start from uh, the problem, identifying the problem, what problem you like to solve by building your model. And to build your model, you probably go to your data and you, you, know, you build with some data, and sometimes it's 80% of your, your work. And then uh, you set up uh, your hypothesis and experiment and train, and somehow you build your model. And then deploy your model to the production and monitor the model, how it works, and probably repeat these uh, iterations and uh, more and more. I think if you can uh, build your model, the perfect model from the first iteration, you don't have to have uh, multiple of these iterations, but I think usually uh, you will go through multiple these uh, multiple iterations to improve your model. So, I think it's uh, really important not only uh, uh, building the model very well, but also how quickly you can uh, go through these iterations. It's also a really critical uh, factor uh, on your model because we like to improve over time. So, uh, but un unfortunately, there are a lot of, a lot of different components uh, Related to your machine learning system, I think this is a famous diagram that you probably uh, saw somewhere before. So your machine learning code is usually very uh, small uh, part of your system. If you try to bring your uh, machine learning model to the product, you have to actually take care of a lot of different uh, things uh, that actually uh, sometimes slow down you, uh, your iteration of your model development. So like to uh, like to uh, talk about uh, what what's happening here. So do you, do you see uh, any problem problem in this picture or in this area? I uh, I see a lot of problems in this area. Yeah, I do. Um, but as far as what we're going to focus on the agenda today, 
Um, you know, ultimately, uh, something like only 13% of data science models that get worked on ultimately reach production. And so we want to talk about some of the challenges that you see along the way that kind of stall this and that can kind of reduce the number of cycles that Moon talked about um, to ultimately get your model out there to production so that you start getting feedback from your users much quicker. Um, so some of these challenges are things like data dependency and model training, model complexibility, uh, reproducing models that uh, have been done before by uh, training on data which, which may be moving and no longer uh, available. Uh, language restrictions when you're putting models into an in, embedded product. Um, monitoring models in production and ultimately uh, the DevOps portion, uh, who actually owns it uh, once it puts it out there. Uh, finally, uh, how do you actually test and, and deploy these kind of models? So, so uh, let's first start with data dependencies. Uh, what are the data dependencies? And data dependencies are uh, just a simple concept that of what kind of data, how many data that your model depends on. So if you uh, have a, if you don't have a clear idea that this becomes a problem on your iterate language because of data can change it and the distribution of data changes, maybe uh, mapping of your data and your label might be changing or any other characteristics of your data change it, can change it at any time. And if, you are, if your model is not aware of that, then the next iteration, you will end up with maybe very different results uh, in your model. So understanding and tracking of data dependencies are actually saving a lot of your time in the you know, next iteration or the next iteration that other people will probably do on, uh, on your model. So, uh, yeah, so data dependencies are uh, kind of uh, very important and uh, without understanding or keeping track of your data dependencies, uh, your iteration becomes slow. And common practice here is actually uh, keeping a burden copy of your data. And people sometimes think that solves the problem, but it's actually, it helps reproduce, reproducing your, uh, you know, experiment but does it not really help uh, you know, the iteration of your model, uh, model development. So, but uh, some, there can be many different ways to deal with this, uh, the uh, data dependencies, but I think the easiest way is just uh, you know, documenting or uh, make, build a catalog. So uh, I've seen a lot of teams and a lot of companies already have some kind of basic catalog system for the data. And the catalog system I've seen, for example, uh, a lot of companies uh, use high meta store as their um, catalog system. Some companies use Google, some companies use built-in, uh, in-house built uh, solution for catalog data. But those catalog data usually uh, have a, just a basic information, like a, a name of your data set and schema of your data and what kind of build your data set have. But, uh, just adding um, annotations like the, what what models actually uses this data, or uh, you know how frequently update this data is being updated, or maybe the distribution of data, or any characteristic of data is annotated in that uh, catalog. It really helps. So that's it. Uh, something uh, uh, some uh, low hanging fruit uh, you can you can do. And actually, if you don't have a data catalog uh, today, there is a quick, uh, quick way to build it. And I'm sure most of the data scientists are familiar with uh, data science notebook, either Jupyter, or Zeppelin, or any other data science notebook. And data science notebook is flexible enough, actually. You can, you can build a catalog inside of uh, inside the notebook. And notebook is, uh, you can program notebook. So you can actually programmatically generate the preview of your, your data, but you have a flexibility to update any information you want. So this is uh, probably a quick solution if you don't have one uh, yet. In the end, you'd like to build a, you know, a, a proper right uh, data catalog system, but I think it's a uh, data science tool is a good start to build it. And just before we jump to the next subject, we see this problem happen a lot with teams of analysts that are uh, wrangling data, reshaping data, and 
getting it to a clean version that they ultimately trust and loan to someone else and then kind of start reusing it, it kind of creates a, almost a chain of dependencies that kind of live throughout the org. So that's something I saw a lot uh, working with uh, large teams of analysts. So um, one of the other challenges that you reach uh, with putting a model to production is uh, how to think about model complexity is very different when you're trying to um, build a predictive model that you're going to use um, on demand on your own, on your own terms. Uh, when you start putting things to uh, production, you, you stop worrying about uh, how important accuracy is uh, because you really have to start thinking more like an engineer and, and really start thinking about the trade-offs um, that you have to achieve. Uh, you know, it's really great to get that nice R-squared value that's really high and a highly predictive model. Uh, but when you start having to put things to production and you have to service a million uh, requests a day, you're going to have to make some trade-offs and maybe get a slightly less predictive model, but a highly more, much more functioning. And so it's not always the same person who's able to kind of think through both sides of the problem. Sometimes it's one person who's able to really think through um, the right way to get a predictive model, but who ultimately kind of implements it, deploys it, serves it, uh, can be a, a different person. Um, you have to think through what kind of load is uh, this model going to face in production? What kind of infrastructure do I need to support it? Uh, how do I evaluate this before I have any data about um, my users and how they're using it? And ultimately, what's the cost benefit? Is it really worth it to put this model um, to use at scale the way I want? Uh, these are tough questions for uh, most analysts to answer on their own. And um, we can also talk about the repository. And I think it, uh, many people here often face a uh, situation like this. Oh, I can run my code for my, my project or my notebook in my laptop, but other people cannot, cannot run the same code or uh, able to run but getting on different results. So that's it, I think. It, so if uh, your model iteration, actually, model development iteration begin with uh, the reproducing the previous results. And then you can actually improve, uh, improve uh, your model on top of it. So reproducing uh, the previous experiment is, uh, I think, the first step. And if you cannot do the first step, you cannot improve your model. So reproducibility is really important. And uh, it's actually uh, not really difficult to address the reproducibility. So we can identify some problems that cause re re uh, Think, make things hard to reproduce. And one uh, first thing is that uh, one time environment can be different. Your operating system or your uh, language versions or your libraries, they, they can be uh, different. And they, they, they can uh, cause uh, you know, some code is not running on uh, one machine, but other machine able to run. And even some, sometimes when library version is different, you uh, end up with different results. So that problem can be addressed by, uh, I think the uh, common typical solution is containerize your, uh, your runtime uh, nowadays and run your uh, workload, your notebook, your project inside of the uh, container or uh, Kubernetes uh, cluster. That's, I think, the common uh, solution. And that, works really well, I think. So uh, if you take care of the reproducibility, I think a container right in your runtime is the, uh, the first thing you like to do. Another one is uh, not always all the uh, resources you can use, like the uh, computer resources, are available. So uh, memory, um, you know, amount of memory you can use, or the special hardware, like the CPU, is not always available. All. So even if you are you have access to it, other people might not have an access to it. So it's hard to be with this who doesn't have that uh, access to the resource. Also, it's the same thing applies to the data. So you may have access to the data, but other people may not have the access to the same data. So addressing that problem is actually if you are uh, moving your uh, runtime environment from your laptop to the uh, server side that everyone can uh, connect and share, that's easier to actually address. So uh, server side, we can almost guarantee that our resources are available for everyone. And, and, and
and uh, access the data is it, uh, actually easier to control on the server side because of Can you also try to talk as close to this thing as possible? Uh, yeah. Without being, okay. you know, weird about it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So access to the data is easier to control in the server side because of the uh, if you have to if you are dealing with critical uh, sensitive data, then you like to restrict the uh, uh, access uh, physical physically and also via your you know. Uh, ACL list, so it's easier to apply in the server side instead of applying all the security and uh, firewall and all, all the access control um, list on individual's laptop. So uh, that's it. Uh, general uh, general uh, way to address this one, but especially on the data science node tool, I think it, a lot of data science node tool I see on the GitHub is hard to run on my laptop. It, is it some notebook I can just download and run, but some, some notebook is hard to run because of I have completely different uh, set of libraries and libraries not installed on my laptop, for example, I have to manually install. So I think there can be uh, some kind, some, I, I propose some common practice uh, for the data science notebook that data science notebook nowadays, either it's Jupyter or Zeppelin or any other notebook, have a, uh, capability of inline configuration and capability of uh, inline installation of the library. So there is no reason not doing, not leveraging that. So in Node we can actually embed uh, the environment configuration that we need and also able to uh, list uh, what kind of library we, we need and then we, we can start our work. And in the end, uh, for documentation purpose, we can just print the versions of libraries or environments that we are depend on. So I I created uh, one one example here. So actual notebook can be more complicated, but for example, I can. Uh, this is not a real real uh, access key and uh, security key. Don't don't try this. <laughs> yeah, zoom in. Okay. Yeah, this is not real one. So. Don't try this. And we can configure uh, the environment variables or the uh, requirement of the cluster resource that you want to use or any other, uh, any other dependencies. Like, for example, in this case, we are uh, defining that we are using Python 3.4 and uh, depends on some library with specific versions. And this node 2 is running inside a container, and it will always run exactly the same version, exactly the same environment. So uh, you can uh, expect the same results always uh, from the from the notebook. And once you have done just documentation purpose, just uh, one command, pip this, uh, or uh, if you are using conduct, just conduct list to document your uh, environment. That really helps uh, once other people are trying to reproduce your work. So I think it's a uh, small, uh, small, easy, easy things to do, but it really, really helps. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes you do a lot of work uh, to write a great model, and you have a product manager that comes up to you and asks you, "Yeah, if you could just go ahead and rewrite this in Java instead of Python, that'd be great." And all of your favorite uh, tools and packages that you've kind of come to rely on, you've got to shift your way of thinking, and you've got to re-implement it, and that can be really challenging and really scary, and not everyone is kind of up for, for that, and so um, this is not uncommon when you start embedding uh, models that you kind of prototype quickly with these kind of uh, modern notebook tech, um, and ultimately deploy uh, in something on-prem, for example. Uh, we had, uh, we went through something similar after uh, my last company got acquired, Perspica, where we had to um, translate some of our AI ops uh, machine learning models into the new code base at AppDynamics. And so uh, to kind of fit with some of the requirements of our legacy customers, really had to make it work with uh, a lot more restrictions than we were anticipating up front. So just something to be aware of when you start uh, dealing with uh, more restrictive enterprise customers that 
uh, you don't always get access to all the tools that you uh, come, have come to rely on over time. And uh, monitoring, let's say you have deployed your model to the product, and your model is working on, on the product, and users are, uh, some other systems are uh, you know, sending a request to your model. So if there is a, only one thing that you can monitor, what do you like to monitor? Anyone have any idea what you like to monitor your model? So I think that there are hundreds of different metrics you can choose how, how what to monitor. And actually, more you can monitor is probably better usually. But I think it, uh, if there is one the most important metric that you need to monitor, I would like to uh, select, I, I can select one. Uh, this is a, maybe arguably the most important metric that you like to monitor on your model. Uh, which is a uh, uh, prediction bias. So this is a uh, simply uh, average, you know, distribution of your distribution of your uh, predicted label, probably or usually the same to the uh, distribution of your uh, observed uh, labels. Uh, what 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 this is what this means is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, let's say I have a model that identify. Uh, puppies in the picture, and we know that. Let me assume that we know that one percent of the total uh, pictures in the world have a uh, puppies uh, in it. So my model, I, I expect in any cases, my model will give a uh, one percent of uh, input pic input pictures. Out of uh, let's say I have hundred pictures, then probably one picture will be. Uh, my model will identify, classify one picture as a puppy. If I have a thousand model, uh, maybe ten uh, picture will be classified as a puppy. And that's it. Uh, uh, because of uh, I know the real world uh, will real world distribution will somewhat like one percent. So if let's say I I have another iteration and I, I improved uh, my model and my model suddenly giving a five percent of picture is 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 a easy included puppies then I immediately know something wrong right something wrong with my model my model have a bug I need to fix so this is I think uh, probably the simple uh, but really important metric that I like to uh, monitor. And uh, once you monitor uh, this one, then you maybe like to have something like an action limit. Uh, the, I, I leave uh, one of the articles use article on the right, and some company a couple of years ago, uh, which is a trading company, uh, uh, lost four, 440 million in 45 minutes. And probably they didn't have a uh, prediction bias and probably they, they didn't have action limit uh, based on it. So what happened here is uh, uh, they deployed uh, their model to trade and the model starting to lose uh, 10 million every minute and in 45 minutes then they, they lost 40, 440 million dollars. Uh, I think it, if they uh, had uh, some kind of a uh, prediction bias uh, that says oh my model cannot lose more than you know, for example, uh, two million in, in a minute, and they uh, they uh, connect to uh, their action limit. If my model uh, loses more than X million dollar in a minute, and then it triggers alarm and waiting for the manual intervention, for example, and then they probably uh, you know could able to save their company, but. Uh, maybe they didn't have this one. So I think it, if your mod model uh, have a real world action uh, based on the output, then I think it's a really good idea to put uh, your action limit and maybe action limit can be uh, based on your prediction bias. So going through this loop and getting that feedback is challenging enough when you're at a digitally native, you know, uh, tech company where you have the ability and you're empowered with all the tools to do this on your own. It's even more challenging in highly siloed organizations where handoffs need to occur for each of these steps to happen. 
So when you have to kind of give your model to security and they don't truly understand the business questions that it's trying to solve, then they hand it off to QA to, to validate for something else. Um, ultimately, uh, your IT operations team is the one that puts it up uh, into production. Um, they're so disconnected from the problem by that point, uh, they wouldn't even know how to kind of catch and monitor some of this observation bias uh, that, that Moon is talking about. So uh, it's, it's great when you know, you're a data scientist or a team of analysts and you can kind of still manage this entire loop on your own. Um, because as soon as you start doing handoffs, it gets much, much uh, more difficult. And uh, I'd like to also uh, talk about testing and uh, deploying uh, your model. So I think it's a really uh, common practice uh, as a software engineer that once you write the code, you write a uh, test also, and your code needs to pass the test, and then you deploy. Uh, sometimes the deploying is we often hear about uh, CI and CD continuous uh, integration and continuous deployment. It's really common in the software development uh, cycle, uh, but it's not too common in the data science uh, modeling, I think. So um, this, I'd like to introduce some, uh, some of our efforts. Uh, we uh, we uh, did some uh, experiment uh, work and implementation with the Apache uh, Japanese community about how we can uh, improve testing and deploying uh, you know, when you develop a model for uh, when data scientists develop a model. So this is it. Uh, the basic idea is uh, uh, data scientists use uh, uh, many different tools, but Notebook is one of their uh, primary tool. And Notebook, uh, usually, I, as far as I can see, a lot of Notebooks in GitHub doesn't have any testing, uh, right? So it's not really common uh, to have you Notebook know, to, to be uh, have a automated test, but we like to bring that you know some good practice from the software engineering to the data science. science. And another one is uh, uh, software engineering engineers are I think it's uh, nowadays more and common and common to deploy themselves, deploy their code to the production because there is some safeties uh, that prevent breaking the production system. I think test is one of the uh, you know, safety system, there is a... A question in test, data science usually means test on new data for accuracy or generalization. Software engineering usually means regression testing on historic data to get the same results. Right. What test do you mean? Uh, I think it, that's a great question. So data uh, tests uh, for the data scientists and tests for the software engineer might be different, and I think it's actually true. Uh, but I, what I like to do is, for example, if, even a data science, science code, modeling code, there is a very basic uh, functions like a converting, let's say converting the date, that, that can be a, a smallest so, a pieces of software. And also we can actually test uh, some, uh, for example, prediction bias. Uh, once you got a model with uh, some a portion of data set, you can test, uh, you can validate your model. So, uh, to not break uh, the production, uh, you know, in a in a completely different way. So, uh, I I think there are many things you can put in the test. Probably the data scientists know what need to be tested uh, more than I know, but I know that uh, somehow before you put anything in the production, you need uh, the you know the code or the model need to be tested to go to to go to the production. Uh, so I'd like to, uh, that's a really good point, but I'd like to uh, not go too deep, deep into what we actually need to be tested, but I'd like to introduce some framework. Uh, this is maybe one of 10 different ways, but I'd like to introduce some framework that data scientists can put their own test. Does it make sense? Okay. So. Uh, general idea is that uh, notebook can be tested. I think it's not really a uh, hard concept. And another one is once notebook is tested, I think bringing your model to the production is it sometimes it's really easy, sometimes it's really difficult. Some company asks uh, you to rewrite the, your model in the C++. Some companies just let you uh, deploy uh, your model, you know, your uh, save TensorFlow model to the, your serving infrastructure, which is not very difficult. So 
A lot of companies have different uh, policies and process how to uh, bring your model to the production. But what I like to focus is uh, data scientists, once they develop the model, it, it's supposed to be as close as a production. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily be written with different languages because that brings uh, more problems sometimes. So I like to, uh, with the Japanese uh, community, we like to experiment or propose some, some system that helps uh, data scientists uh, test their model themselves and uh, put uh, the model into the production themselves uh, as much as possible. So let me share uh, the concept, how it works. So uh, this, uh, let me increase some font. Uh, yeah, this is just a notebook. Uh, you can see there is a uh, really, really simple down uh, classification uh, function here. Probably in the real world, you will put your uh, model here, you know, machine learning model you trained uh, with your data. But in this case, uh, I just put, you know, just handwritten rule here. So I'm classifying an input text. If the text is longer than five characters, it's true. If it is not, it's false. So it's a really simple uh, te text classifier. And there is no reason not doing, uh, writing a any sort of test here. Uh, and this is a, a one uh, kind of annotation or one special uh, feature that adding this uh, function as an uh, endpoint. I will explain it later. But writing this test doesn't mean that it will, it will make uh, things safe. Uh, writing test means uh, tests need to be executed before you deploy your model. So. One thing that uh, we uh, introduced, uh, the concept that we introduced is, let's say I modify the model, or like, uh, actually I, I, I should modify the model uh, in this way, and let's say I create a revision six, and then before deploy, I have to uh, run the test, I have to pass the test. I, I think it's a really common Thing, uh, in the in the software de software development and uh, this is a simple set of tests but you can actually go uh, more complicated here so I expect tests will be fail uh, actually all these uh, uh, tests are running in a separate uh, pod separate container in the Kubernetes cluster so anyone who run the test the result will be always the same so it's a, a fully reproducible uh, notebook and once uh, it takes some time to run the test but uh, let me uh, run another one with uh, the correct code uh, which will be revision 7 and I'm running this one up as well and let me check if actually the, my, my machine is running the test here so revision six is a failing because of I uh, changed my model in the wrong way. And the revision seven will pass the test because I corrected them right. So uh, we'll take a little bit of time to run the test. So I think this is a, uh, just a simple test infrastructure embedded in, uh, in the notebook, but I believe this encourages uh, you know, data scientists to run the test against their code and their models. And that will bring uh, the notebook one step, you know, a little bit more closer to the production. I'm not saying this is perfect for the production, but at least it's much closer than before to the production. So once uh, the model passes the test, then uh, the system probably have a, a deploy button uh, to the production or maybe a staging system, it depends on your, uh, your you know, situation. So let's say I click uh, start serving in this case, then I, I see this uh, green dot that my uh, notebook, actually the model inside my notebook is being deployed and uh, up and running here. And I have an endpoint to call my model. And let me actually try to all my model uh, here. Mm -hmm. 
<coughs> yeah, when yeah, when I call my model with a uh, long text, I I can see uh, my model returns true. And if I call my model with a uh, very short text, uh, like a short input, like a three, two character, I can see my model returns false. So once I deploy my models and I, I just uh, call my model a couple of times and I get uh, uh, the metrics on my model. So I can see uh, number of requests and I can see uh, latencies, but uh, what I'd like to see is uh, how uh, my model is performing. And I, actually, you can put your own metrics uh, here. In, in our case, we put a metric uh, is uh, uh, how, how much my uh, input is far from, how far my input is from uh, length 5. That's it, you know, the uh, monitoring value at the moment. But in real, real mind case, you will put uh, more you know, practical data to uh, see how your model is performing. So in this way, you can monitor how your model is performing. So you can imagine that uh, when data scientists have an iteration of developing a model, uh, how when you know, input data changes or uh, new, uh, applying new algorithms, then you can see how, how quickly a data scientists can it, it have a, you know, iterate on the model, model deployment. Yeah, great question. So the question Moon, and I'll let uh, Moon answer this one, is about, uh, okay, this is a really simple model. Um, you know, what, what about with more complicated, what about with larger data sets, what about with, um, you know, more sophisticated, more modern frameworks? Uh, what, what's possible? You know, this is a really simple, you know, workflow, but what, you know, what else is kind of possible here? Uh, is that? Yeah, not just in the testing side. The testing yeah. side is very important. So what what can we push to production right now, basically, or put put to model? As far as modeling infrastructure, like TensorFlow or PyTorch or the thing of you know APIs that they support. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. I I think this is maybe too simple. You know, too simple example. But I think it, the, the key here is you can define any, any Python function here. Your Python function, inside of your Python function, actually you can, you can load a TensorFlow library or PyTorch library and you can read uh, uh, pre-trained pre -trained data or you can train there. However, you, you, know, uh, you, you can, you can uh, load your models, uh, TensorFlow model or any other model, and actually you can write a simple Python wrapper here, and the, uh, the argument of the, uh, your Python function will be uh, uh, HTTP request body will be translated into the argument, and uh, your uh, function return uh, actually first argument of the first uh, this is returns uh, tuple. So the first one, first item in the tuple is uh, actually translated into the REST API uh, response uh, body. And the second, second one is a dictionary, and, and the second one will be consumed by the metric system. So actually you can load, uh, as long as the memory of uh, this runtime of those, you can load a complicated and large model uh, in, uh, you know, with Py, uh, TensorFlow uh, li library or PyTorch library, the library, or, uh, you know, whatever library you want. And there is a, uh, actually a very uh, small limitations, like uh, limited, all, almost only limitation is your uh, computing 
uh, resources, I think. Sorry, I, can, I arrived two minutes late, so I covered this already, then, you know, I'll talk about it later. But I'm curious about the versioning that you guys have going on in the notebook, because I feel like Jupyter is very weak version control, and so I'm a little curious how you guys have solved that problem. So uh, the versioning, uh, the question is how we uh, solve the versioning, right? Yeah. So you're actually working there's several of there. Right. Uh, so Zep Zeppelin have a pluggable uh, notebook storage uh, layer. So the, uh, there are a couple of implementations, like uh, uh, the basic implementation is a local file system, another implementation is a Git repository, another implementation is S3. So you can actually plug in uh, your own repository. Uh, to uh, store notebook, but uh, some uh, the no uh, storage layer when you uh, extend, you can choose just a simple storage or version storage. So in case of a Git repository, you implement version uh, notebook storage, and in that case, you can see uh, this versioning uh, you know uh, buttons on the UI. So it depends if you are using uh, the notebook storage that supports versioning, then you will be able to see those buttons on your user interface. And that's for, for Zeppelin, for, for Zeppel, our enterprise product. We, we support the same functionality, but we also kind of keep a Google edits kind of style, um, keep your revisions as you go kind of history. So that way you don't need to uh, remember to hit save at that critical moment. Uh, you kind of have uh, access to all your revision as you kind of uh, work through uh, finding the model you need. So. You also mentioned you had data versioning. We, uh, we do consider data versioning like a really important uh, aspect of kind of uh, making sure the right model goes to production. So uh, one of the pitfalls we, you know, one of the quick so solutions that we talked about was just keeping, you know, literal copies of data as you're working through each of the steps of your analysis so that you can kind of revert to, to an earlier state. Uh, this is really important when you're working with uh, sets like uh, streaming data. So, uh, Moon, do you want to talk a bit more about that? Yeah, I think that's a really uh, good issue, uh, how, we, how we want to take care of version, versions of different data. But also, it's, uh, at the same time, it's a really difficult issue to solve because of all the data. Uh, when data is small, it's easier to keep a copy. But when data is really big, it's difficult to have a copy of that. And the, the storage system uh, data uh, stays on is always different. Some data are, uh, some people use the S3 to store data. Some data are on the SQL database or uh, SQL-based data lake. And some data are on the you know somewhere in the completely different format. So uh, sometimes storage itself uh, supports snapshots, for example, that helps uh, keeping a copy of data. Or some some database system or data lake system supports uh, keeping a delta only delta of the data, so you can go back to any particular point uh, more easily without storing whole entire copy of data. And so I think it's uh, really tightly related to uh, connected to uh, underlying uh, storage system or data source that you are using and managing the list of the uh, different uh, you know, versions of data. That's, I think, uh, another, another thing that on top of this story. So it's a really good topic. We like to address some, uh, you know, someday, but uh, it's also really uh, complicated and difficult topic, I think. Great, so just kind of the, the key takeaways from our, our talk, uh, think beyond the algorithm, uh, think about the trade-offs, especially as you kind of move to put your model to production. Uh, what works in development will likely not work immediately in production, so uh, move quickly to get a couple cycles um, and to, to get that feedback quickly, and ultimately try to apply some of those uh, software engineering best practices to data science. Thanks, everyone.